Hi everyone, welcome back to the Modeler NAS channel. Today let's add some colors to this dull grey plastic appearance K84 and turn this kit much more interesting for the eyes and if I can say so, more realistic and alive. So take a seat and let's go. As I said on the first video of this project, I wanted to make the third Chutai 47 Sentai from the Japanese Home Defense Force in 1945. There are not a lot of pictures of the real machine to use as reference. I found only two pictures from aircrafts from the same Sentai. So weathering effects will be an interpretation based on these pictures and also from other Hayates from that period. So let's start. First of all, I applied a lighter coat of Tamiya Surfacer to check for irregularities and flaws. With that done, I airbrushed a quick coat of Alclad aluminum on the areas around the cockpit and fuselage torso, basically the areas where I saw some half chipping. For this project, I will try something different from my standard painting methods. I usually work with post shading, but this time, to give some color variation, I painted some isolated panels with shades of yellow, red and grey, as a pre-shading step. All of them in pale shades, because I don't want to go too heavy on the main color. First I was masking the panels to create the finite color variation, but then I decided to go rogue, and painted without masks, which should help with color transitions, or so I hope. But actually, after thinking a while, the panel line will do the job of breaking the color line, so masking doesn't seem to be an essential step. And of course I still need to paint between the lines, just like children's coloring book. After the paint is dried, I used a stiff brush and gently scrub the whole kit. <laughs> Jesus Christ, great. Oof, that was close. So as I was saying, I gently scrubbed the whole kit. I'm doing this to get rid of paint in areas where it did not adhere very well and avoid unpleasant future surprise. Besides, these colors were applied also in very thin layers, which also doesn't help a lot the paint to grip. A coat of automotive clear varnish was applied to protect these thin paint layers and then a good coat of wash to increase the pre-shading effect. You see, applying wash over rivets after the painting may turn them too visible. Of course you can use pin wash slightly darker than the camouflage color, but this way you can turn the whole aircraft darker than the desired effect. Not saying I'm not going to use wash later, but I will try to keep the contrast of the washed rivets through the painting process, only attenuating the contours, so they will be visible only on closer look. Well, in theory it should work, now let's see if it's possible to do it. Here you can check the result. One thing that I should point out is that by doing the spray wash, you can check for panel lines misconnections and fix them prior to painting, something that you only find out at the final steps of the most common painting approach. Some speckling with oils was also added to increase color texture and variation using black and sepia. And that completes the pre-shading step. It was a lot of work and very time consuming, and I really hope it worth all the effort. Well, let's see. After the wash was dry, I sealed everything with a coat of automotive varnish as a safe step. This way if I screw something I can remove the new layer of paint reducing the chances of losing the pre-shading effect. This is much more an insurance, I just hope to not have to remove anything. Furthermore, after it is completely cured, I slightly sanded the fuselage to reduce or eliminate the rivets texture, leaving only in these small black dots. Well, with that done, I started taking some measurements, masking and painting the white bands on the wings and the fuselage. I opted for limiting the painting area now because I need to keep the pre-shading effect visible, and increasing color layers might not be a good option. The bands were painted with white with some black sand, so not pure white. The dilution was around 90% and I painted small areas to don't end up with a homogeneous layer. As the Hinomaru is quite simple to cut masks, I prefer to paint them instead of using decals. I used some tapes to get roughly the same position on both wings, stick the circles in place and then add the surrounding mask. This way it's easier to place it on the right spot and be sure that the surrounding mask is the perfect circle. The tricky part is to get the right color, or at least something close enough. 
First, I apply the yellow to help the red to build up faster and avoid a pinkish shade when sprayed over white. Then I use a mix of Tamiya Red and a few drops of Tamiya Whole Red to make the red a bit darker and bloody. Roughly 70% red and 30% whole red, but I eyeball it, as I'm used to do with my color mixes. Anyway, even the acrylic Tamiya paint drying time is quite fast, curing time is not so. So masking it just after painting might rip off the paint layer, especially when using it very diluted. So, waiting it to cure, aka overnight, is a good measure. Meanwhile, I cut some masks for the tail markings of this squadron. The 47 Sentai tail marking seems ok to cut, as it has straight lines. First, I scan the decal sheet and print it to use as a reference. Then I stick transparent tape over the markings and cut it with the hobby knife. I also add the tape on its back, so I can use it to cut masks for both sides. But why am I doing this? Well, I think it was a good idea to stick a kabuki tape over it and then cut it to the right shape keeping both positive and negative masks. And the transparent tape over the paper will prevent the kabuki to stick on the paper, making it easier to remove. Well, it seemed to work well, as you can see in this test bed. The procedure was the same as with the Hinomarus. First, I placed the lightning, if I can call this way, then place the negative mask over to maintain the right shape and facilitate its positioning. Remove the positive mask and it was ready for painting. I masked the Hino Marus and removed the tapes from the white band's outline, with a lot of fear that something was going to be ripped off. Oof. After drying the sweat on my forehead, I masked the remaining bands on the fuselage. The painting was made with a mix of Tamiya yellow and some drops of red, slowly added to match the deco color that I use as my reference. I painted the whole area with this mix and also added some white and small areas to give some variation. The same was done with the bands on the fuselage. Then I masked the lightning to receive the red details. When I was satisfied, I just placed the positive mask back on and removed the negative one. Now it will be kind of a surprise for later, huh? All this to avoid multiple paint layers and killing the appreciating effect. The anti-glare over the calling was also masked and painted with Tamiya black rubber, trying to avoid a homogeneous finish. Now, basically all big markings and bands were painted, so I moved my attention to the underside. First, I finished the assembly by adding the racks under the wings. With so many masking, I feared to rip them off while handling the kit. Well, with them fixed in place, I started painting the underside with Tamiya XF12 as a base color. I painted the underside moving through each panel and rivet lines. This way, I slowly build the color and evaluate the contrast between the new layers and the pre-shading. This first layer was the base and I left some contrast to be covered by a lighter coat of the base color mixed with white. I liked the resultant effect, as it is still possible to see the different pre-shading colors, especially when you change the light incidence angle. Moving to the upper surface, looking at the pictures I have from KD Force, I noticed more wear and chipping on the fuselage, as I mentioned earlier, where I applied the aluminum color. So I tried to give a coat of MIG chipping fluid, more specifically the scratches effect, over the aluminum areas. This is the first time I'm using this product, so let's see how it goes. The upper surface color is the annoying number 7 color, that I researched out there and found no concrete results on the right commercial paint color or mixes. So discussing this matter with my fellow, the modeler, who has particular good eyes for paints, we end up with a mix of Tamiya XF62 Olive Drab and XF14 Japanese Army Grey in a 2 to 1 ratio. I have to give him credits for this mix, because I really like it and seems quite close to some color pictures. Anyway, again the dilution is very high, around 90% alcohol, and I focus the painting on each individual panel around the kit coloring with an as sharp as possible stream from the airbrush. One thing that I have to point out is that on the areas of the chipping fluid, you can see it reacting with the alcohol, 
So it's important to give quick passes instead of focusing on building the color on these areas. Once some paint had gripped, then it's easier to paint and the reaction is not so fast. The same has happened to me while painting the interior, however I used the hairspray instead, which is good but less controllable than this mix scratch effect. I also added more XF14 to the mix, in a 1 to 1 ratio, for some highlights and color variation, especially in areas more exposed to sunlight as wings and doors. This gives a wear appearance for the kit. Well, time to remove the masks. It was a mix of excitement and fear, I was thrilling to see the results, but also afraid that something went wrong and I should go through all the repairing process. But in the end everything was fine. Painting these big markings was a good idea after all, to get rid of the decal appearance and save the appreciating effects on these spots. Time to chipping. The heavy chipping was made adding some tap water to the areas with the scratched effects. This added to the thin paint layers were super easy to do with a toothpick. I just tried to follow some reference images. Now here's some tips on making scratches without chipping fluid. As I applied a good coat of automotive gloss varnish to protect the under layers, scratching it with toothpick doesn't really damage the surface, only scratch the upper layers of paint. And this is even easier to do if you just wait the paint to dry and soak it with water. It almost feels like you have chipping fluid underneath. But it really works that easy if you use matte paint in thin layers and not cured, only dry to the touch. At this point I decided to paint other yellow thin markings instead of using the provided decals. Masking these areas were quite time consuming and also I risked changing the yellow shade a bit as it is an eyeball paint mix. But that was okay, I guess. I also forgot to paint the yellow leading edge of the wing, so I took advantage of the situation and painted everything. After that I sealed everything with automotive glossy varnish and applied the remaining decals. Only a few of them, like the tail number, fuel tank caps and katakana writing. The decals are good and easy to use, however the transport film can be seen depending on the angle you see. So once more automotive varnish was applied, but now only over the decals. I like this varnish because after cured it is rock hard and very resistant to other products. After cured I sand over the decals to disappear with the small steps of the transport film. You can see here what I'm talking about, right wing showing the film while the left wing was already sanded. Another thing that you can see is that the rivets are completely sealed because there are no more holes but the small dots are still visible under the varnish coat. This methodology was thought to not use washes on the surface, but I used a mix of black and sepia washes on the wheelbase, the inside covers and landing legs that usually show oil leaks and stains. That was the only place where I applied pin washes. After dried, I applied a coat of automotive satin varnish to give a slightly rougher surface that will help to grip the next effects. Ok, let's add some oils, starting with the wheels. Most of the World War II pictures of this aircraft show them landing on land and dirt fields, so we use some oil mixes and earth tones focusing around the rubber close to the wheel hub. These oils were set on a piece of cardboard which helps to suck the oils of the paint leaving the pigment, which dries much faster. With a stiff brush I faded the effect where I wanted, and if need to clean I moistured the brush with spirits to remove the excess paint. I also added some dust effects on the wheels bay and covers, and also a bit on the plane underside, but not too much. Remember that this is an aircraft, not a land vehicle, so go easy on dirt and dust. To increase the contrast between the wings and control surface, I used the same method painting a oil mix of black and sepia along the panel line of the control surface and then blending and fading the color only on one side. This builds up a fake shadow, increasing the impression of a small gap on the movable surface. Still on them, these control surfaces were made with painted fabric, thus I used a slightly lighter color on them while airbrushing. To give more 3D effect on this fabric, I painted the upper tip of the spars with lighter oil color then blending towards the darker middle. I'm not sure if you can call this technique OPR, but at least it resembles it or shares some principles. 
I also added some white oil dots on the anti-glare cowling to give a more wear look. Leaks effects were done with thin oil paints with spirits, this time quite moisture, so it was possible to draw some thin lines. These leaks were done on the oil cooler and the fuel tank caps. The exhaust and age 05s were painted with a first coat of oilclad gun metal. Exhaust received a further layer of brown and rusty shades, while the guns got some graphite as highlights. Two pieces of stretched sprue were painted red and cut to size as the gear position indicator rods. And finally I used a 0.047mm flexible wire, used on 700 scale ship's rigging, as the aerial from the tail to the antenna in the cockpit aft and to the tip of the right horizontal stabilizer. And this is it! Here's my 7 second scale Kid 4 Hayati from Arma Hobby. I would like to make some remarks on the whole painting process, which is the first time I tried. Usually I use several layers of paint, working mainly in post shading and pin washes. This time I inverted the sequence, making the wash first and then working with thin layers of paint, taking care to not kill the wash effect. Well, I've seen modelers using this pre-wash for panel lines, but my intent was to approach the rivets in a more subtle way, not making them pop up so intensely with post-wash. So, first remark, I liked a lot the effect I achieved, however the color I was looking for didn't go as planned, and I think it should be a little bit more olive. Here's the comparison between the chips I made before painting and the kit. Well, as I was using very thin layer of paint, it got a bit lighter than I expected. My mistake was making the chips with thick paint layers and the kit with thin layer. So it seems that I should use a darker mix than the one I was looking for to balance the effect of a thin layer. Well, next time I'll do better. Second remark, repairing errors seems a bit more complicated than the usual approach, as you have all the effects in the first layers. Well, I can tell you that it really scares a bit, but using a good and strong varnish might solve this problem. With a good coat of protecting varnish underneath, you can sand the upper layers without losing the previous work. Of course you need to be gentle while doing it, and you can also use some chemicals in small quantities to remove some unwanted paint. The whole idea is to have only the rivets dots, not the texture or holes to be washed later. So a good coat of varnish seems a good choice, even if hides some texture that have already been, let's say, painted and don't need wash later. As I said before, this method is an adaptation of what I have seen from model modelers, and there's a lot of room for improvements yet. So I hope you liked the result, thanks for watching this video, your support is very important for me to keep making content, and thanks for all of you guys that have already subscribed to my channel. See you next time with a new project. Cheers!